For some, it can apparently prove difficult to maintain believing in what they know to be a truth when millions of dollars are at stake. During the last hundred years, asbestos fibers have been used in thousands of different products in the construction industry, in shipyards and in households. It was seen as a magic mineral and the use of millions of tons of asbestos created a successful and very profitable industry even though that self-same industry was well aware that asbestos was extremely dangerous. But despite this awareness, the use of asbestos was allowed to develop into one of the biggest occupational health problems of the century, leading to thousands of deaths. And not only for those involved in its manufacture, but for all who came in contact with it. In big production at a Rochdale plant is a new material likely to play a useful part in fighting fire. It's an aluminized asbestos cloth. In the safely open spaces of Oldham Park, the county firemen got themselves up like invaders from another planet. Two gallons of petrol were sacrificed in the good cause, and the stage was set for the drama Man versus Fire. Mankind has always been fascinated by asbestos. From the early beginnings of its manufacture in Canada at the end of the 19th century, the small mineral fibers of which it's composed have filled people with enthusiasm because despite their being soft as silk, they're as solid as granite and can be used in many different applications. Asbestos was promoted, uh, the sales pitch was to call it the magic mineral. Uh, they uh, mainly were able to sell this because it had very good resistance to chemicals, heat, and it had high tensile strength. In European and American industrialization, asbestos was inextricably linked with the potent symbols of progress. Machines, steamships, and large building construction. At the beginning of the 20th century, the mineral was marketed as Lady Asbestos, a Greek goddess, armed with a shield to protect civilization. Numerous factories sprang up and thousands of workers gained employment in the asbestos industry. But as in many other factories at that time, working conditions were extremely dusty. We know from the documents that have survived that the conditions were very dusty and there are stories that workers couldn't see more than six to ten feet in certain parts of the factories. But dust was an accepted fact of life in many industries in those days. Cotton factories were very dusty, the coal mines were, were even dustier. So Asbestos factories were not that unusual in having a dust problem. It was just that asbestos was uniquely dusty and also, as it turned out, uniquely dangerous. As early as 1898, a factory inspector in Britain warned against what she described as the evil dust. In Britain, the government uh, hired a medical inspector of factories and uh, under his direction, the lady inspectors of factories went out and did investigations. And one of the things that they reported in the year 1898 was that there were people getting uh, lung disease from working around asbestos. And they recognized that this was a dangerous material. The lady inspectors actually referred to the evil effects of asbestos dust. At the beginning of the 20th century, more asbestos-connected deaths came to light and as early as 1906, a factory inspector in France learned of 50 deaths among female workers. In the years to come, suspicions grew more widespread, leading to American and Canadian insurance companies taking legal precautions to protect against possible claims. By 1918 in the United States, an insurance industry official published a report describing uh, mortality in dusty trades and in this report the insurance official said that it was generally the practice of American and Canadian life insurance companies to not sell life insurance to asbestos workers on account of the, the hazards of their trade based on reported deaths from such causes as uh, tuberculosis and pneumonia.
Yet still, no one would admit the full extent of the inherent dangers. It finally took the death of a British woman, Nellie Kershaw, to contribute in helping to unravel the mystery surrounding these dangers, with the inquest into her death resulting in a year-long battle over principles of responsibility and compensation. Nellie Kershaw was a young woman who worked at Britain's leading asbestos company, Turner Brothers, in Rochdale. Uh, she died in 1924, and it's an important case because it was the first case in which there was an inquest. The inquest received extensive coverage in the local newspaper, the Rochdale Observer, and presented evidence that told her lungs were peppered with numerous, minute, sharp fibres which had cut directly into her lung tissue, causing thousands of tiny scars, until eventually her lungs could no longer function and she died of suffocation. The coroner in charge of the inquest described the cause of death as asbestos poisoning. But Turner Brothers, the company she'd worked for, rejected his findings. Turner Brothers never accepted responsibility for Nellie Kershaw's death, and basically she was never given any compensation by the company. Um, you must remember that at that time there was no, the government compensation scheme had not yet been introduced. So officially she had a disease which didn't exist. When Nellie Kershaw's widower asked Turner Brothers for financial support in order to cover funeral expenses, his request was flatly refused, lest it create a precedent of admitting responsibility thereby encouraging demands from other past or present employees. Three years later, the coroner in charge of the inquest summarised his observations in the British Medical Journal and during decades to follow, thousands of victims would learn the name of their affliction, asbestosis. Following the publication of the Nellie Kershaw case, the British government decided to embark on a survey of asbestosis in the industry, and they, they examined over 300 workers, and then they reported on this in 1930, showing that over one-fourth of these workers had asbestosis. And the longer they'd worked in the industry, the higher the prevalence of asbestosis. There were so many workers dying from asbestosis that the government had to intervene. They found that the situation was so disastrous that they needed to introduce specific regulations to compel the factory owners to clean up the factories and also um, to offer medical examinations and compensation to affected workers. The law, adopted in 1931, was the first of its kind in the world, but it was far from adequate for the industry managed to have a decisive influence on the final drawing up of the law. The industry, for its part, uh, wanted to limit the scope of the law, and they were successful in making it so that the law only applied to the most heavily exposed workers in the manufacturing plants. And this was very uh, helpful to the industry from a marketing standpoint because the people who use these products, the millions of people in the construction industry and in the shipyards, were not covered at all by these regulations. The practical uses of asbestos are very numerous. At least 18,000 articles are made of it, ranging from packing for steam engines and linings for friction surfaces to bulkheads for aeroplanes. No, not a member of a secret society, nor a medicine man, but an asbestos shield for firefighting. Asbestos comes into the home in the shape of fireproof curtains and covers, and in a variety of patterns. They are one answer to the problem of the careless smoker. Ash, but no char. If, in a playful moment, you feel you'd like to make a bonfire of the tablecloth, see that it isn't made of asbestos. Simultaneously, alongside the development of new products utilising asbestos, more reports were published by British factory inspectors about their suspicions that asbestos also caused lung cancer. The American asbestos giant, Johns Manville, 
decided in all secrecy to conduct laboratory research on mice and rats. The researcher along the way became curious about cancer and he allowed these animals to live out their full lives and it turned out that 9 of 11 of uh, these animals in this group developed lung cancer. But the companies kept him from publishing that. He died in 1946 and uh, the new director of the laboratory wrote up the study that uh, had been done by his predecessor. He included reference to tumors and cancer and the companies who were the sponsors, executive vice presidents and presidents of these companies met in the boardroom at the Johns Manville Corporation in November of 1948 and they sent uh, back directions to the laboratory take out all reference to cancer and tumors and the author of the study did just that. Well, if you pay for research, then you can decide what happens to it. And, and the simple fact was that usually the industry blocked publication. So there was always this attempt to keep bad news out of the headlines. This is the Woodbury Gardens development in Long Island, where wide use of asbestos cement shingles is made. And here in the Southern Homes development, these colorful side walls add beauty to the community. This contemporary home shows how modern asbestos materials can be adapted to any style or design. Notice how the asbestos cement side walls help add dignity and charm. And this is Mrs. Adams. Well, Mrs. Adams, what has been your experience with these asbestos cement side walls? Well, we've been very pleased and well, I like the looks of it. And it's never given us any trouble at all. And so, we suggest you consider this material for the walls of your home. Designed to last a lifetime. A trouble-free lifetime. Even though the production of asbestos increased steadily during the 1950s, it became increasingly difficult for the industry to keep on trying to conjure a positive image. Then, British scientists published results of a test they'd carried out in 1955, which showed that lung cancer among asbestos workers was ten times greater than among the remainder of the population. Even at that time, lung cancer was a well-documented side effect of tobacco smoking, so the discovery caused neither new precautions nor new law initiatives. But upon the discovery by a South African doctor, of a completely new type of cancer linked solely to asbestos. Concern rapidly started to spread. What particularly hit the headlines from the mid-1960s and what particularly alarmed people was the fact that you appeared to be able to get mesothelioma from quite trivial doses of asbestos. In other words, a matter of days, weeks or months rather than years. So that people like housewives and school teachers and carpenters could develop mesothelioma even though they'd never worked in in the asbestos industry and obviously this was particularly alarming partly because asbestos was so ubiquitous it was everywhere almost everybody has had some dose of asbestos at some time in their lives concerns about the risk of cancer left their mark among the buyers of asbestos in november of 1965 the factory manager of the British asbestos company Turner & Newall informed the board of directors that he received daily inquiries from shops, hospitals and other concerned consumers asking for assurance about the safety of their product. Some important customers dropped out. In 1967, for example, British Rail ceased using asbestos for insulation and even within the industry, concern was on the increase. Johns Manville realised as did some of the other asbestos companies in the United States, that they had enormous potential liabilities over their failure to warn users of these products, and they decided to put on the first generation of mild warning labels where they would say something to the effect that breathing excessive amounts of asbestos dust for long periods of time may cause damage to your health, but at least they wanted to be, legally speaking, covered for the possibility of damage suits. But publicly, 
the industry insisted on the absolute safety of using asbestos. The industry in Britain spends a fortune on defending its product and publicising its virtues. Uh, for example, one thing that they did was to subsidise a special pull-out supplement in the Times newspaper, which basically described how wonderful asbestos was, how vital it was to the country's economy, and how trivial the health risks were. In their supplement, packed with positive asbestos advertisements, journalists from the Times newspaper were reluctant to write about health problems in the industry. In certain instances, the health risk may be such that the process must be given up, but certainly there is no indication that asbestos falls into this category. In other words, the industry was so well entrenched, so powerful and so wealthy, that it, it could continue to produce this product even though it was known how dangerous it was. The use of asbestos in the United States continued to go up through the 1960s. And finally, with the emergence of a strong environmental movement in the late 1960s, we started to have uh, a greater amount of regulation of industry. The Occupational Safety and Health Act was passed in 1970. The Environmental Protection Agency was created, and uh, things started to change. From 1969 onwards, there was a steady stream of regulations which tightened up the dust exposure limits for asbestos for people who worked in the industry. Um, as regards the industry's reaction, um, asbestos was rapidly phased out for insulation because that's one area where it's almost impossible to control dust conditions. One of the things the Environmental Protection Agency did was ban sprayed asbestos insulation, which was used on the girders of uh, skyscrapers under construction all over New York and other major cities. And, and that included the World Trade Center. The World Trade, Trade Center actually had sprayed asbestos insulation on the first 40 floors. And then the law was passed, and they stopped using sprayed asbestos for the rest of the building. Those of you who routinely work with asbestos are probably aware of the hazards, but what about those workers who are indirectly involved with asbestos, who may have been excessively exposed to asbestos dust in the past? Now the authorities began issuing precautionary advice in a number of sectors working with asbestos products. And as something completely new, this instruction video from 1975 recommended using dust-proof overalls and breathing equipment when changing old asbestos insulation. I'm ready to go in now, Nancy. Okay, don't forget to put your respirator on before the rip-out starts. There's the next one down below. Oh, sure thing, thanks. And in TV commercials, the American Navy recommended health examinations for all who had previously worked with asbestos. One of the materials workers used to build this ship was called asbestos. And after all these years, they found that working around and breathing asbestos may cause bad lung diseases, including cancer. Maybe you worked around asbestos years ago. Maybe you'll get sick, maybe you won't. Don't take any chances. For thousands of people, the warnings came too late. But the human consequences of using asbestos were now being described in a number of TV programs, which for the first time focused on the stories of victims. One of the most significant programs was Alice, A Fight for Life, which dealt with many case histories within the British asbestos industry. The program's key figure was Alice Jefferson, who'd worked for seven months in an asbestos factory at the age of 17, 
and how, 30 years later, she was now suffering with an escalating mesothelioma. Were you ever warned that uh, working there could be dangerous, that you could finish up? No, we used to fool about. We used to make wigs out of that. Uh, you know, like they fool about at work. We used to make wigs out of asbestos and put them on our heads. And, you know, no. I never, never thought it was dangerous at all. A few months ago, Alice's doctor told her she was dying of asbestos cancer. I had a feeling that I had something serious by then, you know, because I wasn't getting any better. You've come to tell me that I've had it, haven't you? Says you. And, uh, she says, you, I says, how long have I got then? And she said, three to six months. Sheila Fenwick never worked with asbestos. Her father just brought asbestos dust home from Turner's Washington when she was a child. At 51, she also died of the asbestos cancer, mesothelioma. I would just like to know how many people Turner and Newells have killed that don't even know they died of asbestos. Take Cape Asbestos in East London. Its general manager was Tony Mendel. How many funerals did you go to during your 12 years at oh, Cape Asbestos? About 110, I'd say. I kept a black tie uh, in, my, in my desk drawer, simply because going to funerals was a, a dismal part of uh, management of that particular factory. Three weeks after this interview, Tony Mendel discovered that he too had asbestosis. I think it, it, it brought home to the public two things. One, that asbestos could cause horrifying cancers. And secondly, that not just workers were at risk. And that was the truly alarming thing about it. Also, of course, it emphasised how duplicitous certain asbestos companies had been and how the government hadn't really protected workers or compensated them properly. So that, that was what made the documentary so, so shocking. By the beginning of the 1980s, the use of asbestos decreased significantly in Europe and the United States, with a lot of countries introducing rigorous regulations on the use of asbestos and in thousands of buildings, asbestos was simply removed during a gigantic clean-up effort. The number of asbestos victims continued to increase due to the time between the exposure to asbestos and the development of asbestosis or cancer, which can take as much as 30 to 40 years to develop. At the same time, the increasing attention meant that a growing number of people demanded compensation. There was a lot of uh, worker resistance to the idea of using asbestos. There was consumer uh, reluctance to purchase products containing asbestos. And as far as getting any kind of insurance coverage for companies that were using asbestos, that was becoming extremely difficult. At the same time, there had been at least a couple hundred thousand claims filed of uh, people who uh, were claiming that they had developed asbestosis or cancer from the exposure to asbestos and they were suing these companies for failing to warn them about the hazards of asbestos. Even though the industry had been aware since the 1930s that asbestos could cause cancer, the compensation claims apparently took the industry by surprise. Some industries did whatever they could to cut their losses by filing for bankruptcy. Amongst them, the largest American asbestos manufacturer, Johns Manville. Manville Corporation's Board of Directors has determined that the corporation should file for reorganization under Chapter 11 of the Bankruptcy Act. Though our businesses are in good shape despite the recession, we are completely overwhelmed by the cost of the asbestos health lawsuits filed against us. While the cleanup continued in schools, public buildings and private homes throughout the 1980s and 90s, an increasing number of countries outlawed the use of asbestos, but the number of sick was still on the increase. The extensive use of asbestos in the 1970s has not yet set its mark on death statistics, which are expected to top around 2015, 
when another 100,000 people are expected to die from asbestosis and lung cancer. But the tragedy continues at a gathering pace in the third world, for when the asbestos industry broke down in the Western world, new markets conveniently opened up in the developing countries. India is one of the countries that still has a high consumption of asbestos and the number of people expected to grow sick is unknown. People will certainly are dying at present and will die in future and have died in the past. But because of lack of data, it is difficult to prove beyond doubt that this is happening. But people are going to die by 2000 and 100,000, it's uncertain. There is no doubt about it. Since 1996, Indian law has forbidden new asbestos mines to open, and India produces only 20% of the more than 100,000 tons of asbestos that the country uses every year. The main bulk of asbestos destined for India is produced by Canada, a country which itself no longer uses the dangerous fibres. Well, the, the Canadian approach seems to be entirely hypocritical because they don't use asbestos themselves but are quite content to export it to other countries. The Canadians are not responsible, nor do they have any influence on what happens in the developing world. They simply ship bags of asbestos fibre to these countries. What happens after that is, is no concern of the Canadians. While the tragedy continues in a number of developing countries, in Europe, so far, it has peaked. In 1999, the EU imposed a total ban on asbestos from the year 2005. More than a hundred years after the first warnings by the British factory inspectors of what at that time they called the evil dust.